Third Sundays, we also receive our uh, mission offering and if anyone's prepared for that, if the ushers could quickly do that for us, just to make sure all the missionaries on field are well looked after and the vision is fulfilled. And I really do thank you for your generosity. There's been tremendous generosity in giving to missions, so that's to the glory of God. So thank you for that. Amen. I'm going to suggest you just with the person next to you or two or three around you, just in a few sentences, ask the question, what is church? I mean, what is it? What what are we doing here today? Just have a chat. Come on. If you get in first, you can ask them and they have to answer it. I mean, what is it? What, what's it all about? What's it about? Okay. I'm sure there are some interesting conversations taking place. I'm not sure how much of the conversation revolves around the question, but nevertheless. People in Australia have an opinion about church and most of them don't like it. And on any given Sunday, 93% of Aussies aren't doing what we're doing. So, if you were the CEO and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, he must be thinking, why ain't it working the way it's supposed to work? And I think the key is in your hand and my hand as to why the church seemingly is becoming increasingly irrelevant to most people. Seemingly. However, I don't buy that completely because I know exactly what's going to happen because we know the end from the beginning. And when God says he's going to send a revival that sweeps across the nation, then we know it's all going to work out just fine. But however, we have a part to play in it, to move with what God is doing. And so I said to the guys at the back who are taping, I said, just call it doing church differently. And I would imagine this would be most pastors' nightmare to even dare talk about this subject. Hallelujah probably the Lord, desperately trying to break into his church, saying, would anyone listen to what i got to say? One of the music team. It's probably one of those dials that's got 99 rings before it stop, stops. And so I, I, I feel encouraged to, to really explore this a little bit today because of the fact that on the second and the fourth Sundays we actually don't do this. And many a pastor friend of mine has said, it's not going to work. If you don't do it the way it's always done, it won't work. And I'm thinking, it'll work all right. If Jeanette and I are the last two in the land, it's going to work all right. Because when God starts to speak about transition, God intends to transition his church from where we are to where he wants us to be. And we are in a period of transition. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that God has allowed the body of Christ to, to get into a weakened state. It was never his desire. And then in desperation, we're starting to cry out again, Lord, we're almost losing our land. We've, we've allowed our authority to be usurped by humanistic philosophy, which is in fact religion because it, it gets the heart really passionately involved without God. And uh, God is saying to his church, if you come back to the blueprints, if you come back to the scripture and find out how it was birthed, you'll get some keys as to how it's going to end. Because the way the church was birthed in the full-blown glory of God 
is the way the church is going to enter into heaven in the full-blown glory of God. Ephesians 5 says that Jesus comes back for a glorious church. In other words, it's so filled with his presence, there's no room for the desire of the flesh that they've been, and its affections all nailed to the cross. There'll be no room for the infiltration of the enemy. At the moment, there are open doors in the spirit realm all over the body of Christ where the enemy just sticks his nose in. And uh, John and I this morning were walking around this building and we were sealing every exit point and entry point in the spirit. We said, devil, you are not even going to put your snozzle anywhere near this place this morning. And we found ourselves cutting off religious demons. We found ourselves cutting off demons of the occult from, I don't know, there must be covens out there somewhere. And they will be sitting there with all the local churches on their map and they'll be doing their little eebie-jeebies. And we've become spiritually dull I'm not saying it to you and to me per se, I'm saying it to us as a body because there's only one church and that's all those who belong to Jesus Christ. There's only one God, one Father. There's only one Saviour. There's only one Spirit. There's only one true doctrine which is the fullness of Jesus. And so we need to stand together and say we're going to reach this city and see it taken for God. But it may not happen the way we've been doing things because if it hasn't happened by now, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So we have to say, Lord, what are the blueprints? What are you saying? What's this transition about? I'm taking great courage to say this because this is an excellent message on how to empty out a church. And uh, I'm going to believe God's going to say to some of you, don't go, don't go, at this point. Now, I don't know what you said about the concept of church, what is church, what's the expectation of church. At the very bottom line, church is two or more gathered together in the purpose of God. The very bottom line, this little little nucleus of believers together uh, comp- uh, comprises church. The book of Acts describes what church is. The church got together, they prayed. The church got together, they broke bread. The church got together, they opened up the word and had apostolic doctrine. The church got together and they became witnesses, martyrs in their generation. We know what church is by definition. <coughs> But in practice, I think we've lost a little bit of some of the dynamic that God intended. And so on the second and fourth Sundays when we don't have this kind of congregation, it may look like we actually have nothing. But what we're saying is you and I are church wherever we are. And we connect as the body uh, in different ways at different times. And it is that sincerely our prayer that on the second and fourth, uh, some, maybe all, but some will really connect with the vision of why we don't do the same thing over and over again. Hopefully this thing is meaningful, otherwise you and I wouldn't come. There's got to be a meaning in it, but it's not the end of it. It's meant to be an empowering and an equipping. The doctrine is meant to come to, uh, to um, share the vision, that we embrace the vision, <coughs> that we have this sense of corporate identity, we understand the meaning of body. This is all part of uh, the scriptural uh, revelation of what church is. But I I think many churches have become like machines rather than bodies. Uh, A machine is quite predictable. A machine, you just sort of program it in, press the same buttons and you get the same kind of response. The worst thing of the machine, that could be like the giftings of the people, still in the machine type structure. The problem is is that when one particular part doesn't work, you get rid of it and you put a new part in. That's a problem. If in fact the body of Christ functions like a well-oiled machine, everyone doing their bit and doing their part, even, even with their giftings, when that part isn't functioning for some reason, get rid of it and put another one in. What's this business of that demoting and pr- promoting in church? There should be no such thing. God calls, God anoints, God appoints. You don't hire and fire. That's not, that's not the, in the spirit of the living God. And what God is doing, he's saying to the church from 1 Corinthians 12, you're not a machine, you're a body. And as a body, body parts, you can't just say, well, I don't need the foot, chop it off. It's really annoying me this week. The onions and the bunions, they're hurting me. I don't need the foot, chop it off. You wouldn't even think of it. (laughs) What's up, doll? And yet we find that in the body sometimes there's less respect for parts of the body that in fact are essential. The scripture says even sometimes the lesser parts, the parts that don't seem to be prominent, the parts that don't seem to have an important function, they're absolutely necessary for the health of the whole body. And so I feel part of what God is doing is bringing the paradigm away from the functional paradigm of this thing that's supposed to look good 
and it's back to a, a relational paradigm where everybody's absolutely needed, everybody's important, no one stands alone, everybody functions, everybody is significant. Now here's the problem. You get three, four, five hundred people in a room and it can't quite operate like that. I mean, if everyone was going to prophesy one by one, I mean, you'd be here till next Tuesday night. I wouldn't be. <laughs> but some people would sit through it all, thinking, oh, this is the way you have to do it. No, there's a principle in Scripture, and I see it with Moses, particularly with Moses, when Jethro, the father-in-law, in-laws have good things to say. We always kid about the poor old mother-in-law, but there's father-in-laws as well, and they've got things to say. And I want to just quickly look at that because it's been impressed upon me quite strongly. Exodus chapter 18. When things were growing, things were booming and the needs of Israel were increasing and I believe the church is going to move into that next phase after we've done a bit of transitioning into the new. There will be multitudes of people coming to the Lord. Hallelujah. Multitudes. And you are needed, I'm needed, all the gifts are needed. And here we have the uh, counsel that came from God. Verse 13, It came to pass that Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood by Moses from the morning to evening. See, there's the problem. By the time you get through everything you have to get through, it takes an awful long time. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that you do to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone and all the people stand by thee from morning to evening? Moses said, to the father-in-law because the people come unto me to inquire of God and when they have a matter they come and I judge between one and another and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Good leadership Moses, well done. Moses' father-in-law said unto him the thing that thou doest is not good thou wilt surely wear away both thou and the people are with thee for this thing's too heavy for thee thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken thou unto my voice I will give you counsel. We need counsel this morning. God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward that they may bring the causes to God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers over thousands and rulers over hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. They shall judge. It will be easier for yourself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If you'll do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all his people shall also go on, to their place in peace. Mark, and it says, Moses hearkened unto the council. Now that scripture has sort of been hitting me from time to time and in the last few weeks it's been bouncing back again into my spirit. And I know that when revival breaks forth, it's already in our hearts, we're praying it, we're declaring it, it's beginning to release. Some congregations are getting the, the, the initial outpouring. Uh, but it's a one body. We, we are in, we're, we're not competing, we are completing the picture of the body of Christ. No competition. The whole body completes the picture. We don't compete. If the church down the road is being triply blessed, where we should be shouting for joy. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. If they're busting at the seams with the numbers of people coming in, awesome. Because we are one church. And if we're led by the Holy Spirit, we are strategically placed, we are strategically connected. It's not a thing that you should take lightly. I said on Friday night to mainly young ones who were at that meeting, I said, don't take lightly this business of connecting yourself to the body of Christ. Take it very seriously because the group of people that you connect with uh, and the dominant anointing that's operating under that group as, as ordained by God is the anointing that will shape your spirit more than any other anointing because the power of a corporate anointing will mould and shape you so that you carry that DNA of that ministry. That's how God builds teams and that's how God works with people. It doesn't look like that. It looks like, well, I just go wherever I feel like going, you know, if it's close, if it's this or that, or they have better music or this or, you know, whichever way we sort of judge these things, we could be doing ourselves a great disservice. We could be actually doing that group of people a great disservice if we're not connecting by the Holy Spirit. Because when God connects a body, the body is fitly framed and joined together by the Spirit. And it's a very serious thing 
that if you're sitting under the kind of DNA that we operate in, and okay, perfectly scriptural, but there are other emphases in scripture that are equally as important, but we're taking the Luke 4.18, the spirit of the Lord's upon us to preach the gospel, heal the sick, see recovery to those who've lost sight and hearing and we're into that miraculous signs and wonders dimension of, of restoration. We love it. It's us. Most of us and most of our leaders have experienced it. We've walked through it. The stumbling stones have become our, our the stumbling blocks have become our stepping stones. The tests that we've had are our testimonies. And so you get this, this flavour, this atmosphere and if, you, if that's not who you are or if, if your spirit's going, oh, I don't like this kind of atmosphere, in all due respect, shouldn't be here. And this thing of, oh, I've got to be dutiful is, is gone. Our allegiance is to God. Uh, I was in one particular congregation for over 30 years. We were not even used to this idea of church hopping. I mean, it didn't exist in that season. It was like, you're just, there you are, you commit and that's what you do. You work to make it, you know, as good as. And after 30 years, this transition came in the form of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the left foot of fellowship was being extended very graciously but I could, I could feel it coming. It wasn't the right hand of fellowship of welcome, it was the left foot of I think it's time you left. That foot was rising. <laughs> and uh, if you're astute, you, you read the signs of the times. <laughs> I'm about to get a boot so I think I might just follow what God is saying. And that's the only reason we even left and didn't even go to another church, went to the Hay Street Mall and started witnessing. I thought everyone did those things in those days. And um, the Lord showed me very, very clearly, he said, don't you start anything, don't you go anywhere until you know what I'm saying. And then I realised that the anointing you place yourself under is the anointing that shapes your spirit. Now I know you have quiet times with God and that's even more important than church gatherings, but the power of a corporate anointing is enormous. Here's a corporate anointing. Your individual anointings join together plus the purpose of God for the ministry. One puts a thousand to flight, two put ten thousand to flight, a few hundred put millions upon millions to flight. So that's the anointing just within the body plus God's purposes for the ministry, his anointing to do the kind of work we're called to do. That comes on top of us. So you have your individual anointing, praise God for it, and we have the, as believers, you and I are anointed by the Spirit. 1 John 2 says you have an anointing. That anointing abides within you. Every Christian is anointed. They don't have to speak in tongues to be anointed. they just got to be saved to be anointed. And the anointing abides and it rests. That's the believer's anointing. It opens up the Scriptures. It teaches you the things of the Spirit. You don't need a man to teach you in the sense of you don't rely fully on flesh and blood. You just receive by the Spirit. You have witness in your spirit that this is truth. This is how Christians should grow. We don't have gurus where we believe everything everyone says unless it witnesses in our heart and it's in line with scripture. Secondly, the believer's anointing uh, joins together with other believers and you have this very, very, very powerful corporate anointing. You have an anointing within, believer, you have an anointing upon for ministry. So the first anointing, the believer's anointing. You've all got a powerful believer's anointing. Secondly, we've all got a mantle that comes upon our lives with giftings and callings called the the ministry anointing. Every believer has that. Not every believer has received it, not every believer understands it, not every believer interprets their anointing, their gifting. But that's why sometimes you stand in front of a prophet and you just say, speak to me, word of God, and God will begin to speak those things that you're not sure of. Sometimes lack of confidence, sometimes you think it's a, you know, getting a big head if you start calling yourself a this or a that and I'm, a, I'm an evangelist. And I, you know, you're allowed to identify yourself. If you don't know your identity, you can't fulfil your destiny. You just go to church meetings. Well, church meetings ought to be designed so that everybody receives from that uh, corporate anointing what they need to do their work of their ministry. And so what I'm saying is the second and fourth Sundays give opportunity for as many who, who feel led and desire and get the, you know, the, the witness from Scripture, I can do something for God. And I'm not suggesting that none of us do nothing or any of us do nothing, but there are significant things you can do for God when God anoints you. He calls, he anoints, he appoints. And uh, here, here the, the, the thing with Moses was the needs are increasing. It's just becoming this incredible weight and burden and the wisdom of God was, well, you can get small groups. You can actually have groups of 10. 
And some people today despise that. They think, oh, that's not a church. That doesn't look like a church. That's ridiculous. That's just a few people sitting together. Well, what's church? Two or more gathered in my name, fulfilling my purpose. And so we have, I believe, in this transition period, uh, a resurgence of opening up homes, opening up business premises, opening up wherever people can gather and Christians gathering together so that church looks different. Who cares what it looks like? It's whether it's producing fruit or not that matters. And this is a phenomenon that's not going to go away as much as some people want it to go away. They find it quite irritating that people can have little churches in their homes and become like pastors. I think it's thrilling. I think it's exciting. It's only if you're really weak in your own leadership that you're threatened by someone else getting an anointing and doing something. I thought that was the whole purpose of it. I thought the apostolic prophetic anointings and evangelistic and pastoral and teaching anointings would equip the people to do the work. And to do the work is, is no, no disrespect, but it's more than handing out the notice, albeit we need someone to do it. It's more than monitoring the car park, although you need someone to do it. I'm talking about significant ministry. I'm not saying that's not... I'm in trouble now, John, are I? There'll be no more volunteers the rest of the year because what I'm saying is that I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> do, put it this way. Do whatever God tells you to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just do it. Get on with it. Do it. That's what I say about uh, Christian congregations. There's an awful lot that's said and done, but there's far more said than there ever is done because we know how to talk the talk. We've done it for years. But now in transition, God says, I'm getting the body to come right back into the cold face of where the world's at in its depressed state with the demonic powers almost engulfing a generation, almost swallowing them up in hell. You know, you talk to young people in the streets, you talk about if it ever gets to the point of there's a heaven or a hell, they'll tell you this, I'm already in hell. And they're not laughing and they're not mocking. They're experiencing darkness, they're experiencing powers, they're experiencing the witchcraft, they move in occult sort of practices, not understanding the, the consequences. So you're not talking about a situation where people are no longer spiritually aware, they're aware. Uh, through the media, uh, through the enormous door of uh, the uh, occult, through drug taking, and uh, they're aware of the spirit realm. And whilst we're doing this thing back here, which doesn't connect with them, we are relevant to them. But when we're saying, you know what, you can come around to the coffee shop and have a cuppa. Or you can come, where do you, you live near me, why don't we catch up at Macca's or, or whatever, whatever God says. See, what does church look like? Well, it looks like whatever God says it should look like. And yet this is still looks like something. This is not, not nothing. I believe when, when the Moses was given this picture, tens, fifties, hundreds, you can, you can handle thousands. And there's different words that are used. I'll just quickly say, say them here so that we know we're onto something here. The, the, the word ESER is a Hebrew word for ten, a small group of ten. Now we could say, well, that looks like a house group or, or a business connection group where there's a small group, everyone can participate, everyone can share, everyone tells their story, their life, people can operate with gifts. You get the whole, everyone's needed, everyone's important. Everyone's actually significant in the group. Now, when I say 10, it can be 11, it can be 15. It's not, this is not legalistic. It's, it means small group. And uh, we've got a number of small groups. Glenn and, and is keeping his eye on, on that aspect so that no one's standing alone. We, we're going to see that multiply by the end of this year into next year. We're just going to see small groups everywhere because we feel it's important. Do you know the time may come where the law of the land is this? You cannot congregate in groups of more than 20 or something. That's already been tried in certain places. And the number one reason so that Christians can't get together to do this powerful corporate thing, that would be the enemy's idea, get rid of the church. You'll never get rid of us. We're salt and light, we're just everywhere, hallelujah. However, we may not always have the privilege of doing something like this. I'm praying that we will. But if perchance we didn't, what happened? Do you lose your faith? You say, no more church, that's the end of that. What's on Channel 7 on a Sunday morning? No, we don't say that. We say, that the church is all right, there's a church all right. This would be a church in my home or in my street or in my suburb and I'll make sure it happens and the whole thing will multiply. I'm not looking forward to it but I'm telling you this, the persecuted church thrives. Any church under persecution just thrives 
uh, Jesus rises up as the lion on the inside and those people, they just, they just tackle it head on. The early church was told, don't teach in the name of Jesus. Stop talking about Jesus. And they came to the Lord in a prayer meeting. Great way to resolve your problems rather than ringing up your friend and having a gas bag on the phone. Get into intercession. Rick Joyner says there's two end time ministries. The end time ministry of accusation and the end time ministry of intercession. I mean, Matthew 24 says there'll be so many issues, so many problems, so many people offended. The love of many will wax cold. The great falling away of those who once were sort of Christian, but now it's not fashionable to be Christian, so we're not going to be Christians. This whole thing is in our generation. This is in our time. You can interpret those scriptures in, in today, right today. And yet that early church got together and began to pray and as they prayed, the room was shaking with the power, the glory of God was manifesting, signs, wonders and miracles. And they said to Jesus, Jesus? They said to God, <laughs> who is Jesus? But they said to the Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, your son, bear your arm. More miracles, more signs, more wonders. What a great response. The moment they were told to be quiet, the moment they rose up and started declaring, more Lord, more Lord, more Lord, more signs, more wonders, more miracles. And that's exactly what happened. And under persecution, you know, the early church turned the world upside down. They were scattered abroad and it says they went everywhere preaching and teaching. So you've got small groups that are important with this great influx of people that are coming, groups of 10. Secondly, you've got groups of 50. The word is misum, M-I-S-S-I-M, misum, Hebrew for 50. And what we see is that, and I'll give these out actually, a couple of the ushers could help, three or four guys or women, doesn't matter, no male or female. Let's give these out. Um, if you wanted to find a group of 50, how would you do it? Well, maybe you could have three or four regional house churches get together. Uh, you know, the, mo- the mods from... <laughs> Don't, don't feel bad about taking mine. Um, the groups of 50 could become regional groups. I'll explain that little funny diagram in a minute. And uh, thirdly, he says you'll have the groups of hundreds that even could lead into thousands. Different kind of groups, all valid church expressions, but with different DNA, for a different group has a different dynamic. Each group has a different dynamic. Try and stay with me back with the group of 10. Look at 1 Corinthians 14:26. I know you'll be fascinated by that picture, but try and keep with me a bit. We'll come back to that picture. 1 Corinthians 14:26. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, that sounds like church, two or more gathering, when you come together, if you want to read it with me, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. Let all things be done unto edifying. Now that description of church in 1 Corinthians 14.26 would work best in a small group. It would work best in a small group. Expect, especially with the Western mindset of church also has a certain time frame. That's not biblical but have, have, nevertheless we've done it like that. We say we'll give a couple of hours but there's no such thing. Church finishes when God stopped his work for that people at that time. And, you know, when I say transition, that means that could be something we transition into as well. Why does God have to stop at 12 just because we say he has to stop at 12? He might have something amazing he's about to do now that he's got total unity. Anyway, that's just something to to wrestle with in your mind. I do know this, that we speak to folk who've been in revival and there's no such thing as a one-hour revival meeting. There's no such thing as a two-hour revival meeting. They might start at nine and they might finish at four or five or six. In fact, on Friday we were talking to, to these guys from Africa saying the meetings go till four, then they go home but they're back at six for the night meeting. <laughs> and we wonder why this atmosphere is now changing the whole uh, landscape of the nations. Well, God, God will help us. He'll get us there. He'll get us there. 
But here 1 Corinthians 14.26 talks about the fact when you come together and it works really well in a small group. And uh, those who are part of small groups, small churches, house churches, grace gatherings, call them what you like, you'll testify that that works. Everyone can say something, everyone has something to contribute, everyone's significant. In fact, if they're not there the next time you miss them because of their anointing, now, you don't feel the same way here. Often we won't even know who is here, who's not here. I will. Because <laughs> I've got this annoying habit of going home and just thinking who wasn't there. And, but it's all good because I start praying. No, it's all good. I don't get on the phone. I just pray. Say, Lord, bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them. But when it runs into hundreds, it gets really frustrating. Like, Arr! what are we doing wrong, Lord? Uh, well, there's more away than there are present. It's a bit of a worry. However, groups of 10, you can easily do that. Groups of 50, for example, on that diagram could be, say, three groups in the far north, northeast, northwest, or groups that are southeast, southwest. And we've divided the whole metropolitan area into sort of eight large regions, which Glenn's got a big map of that, and uh, we, we, we know where you live. And so there are a number of groups already operating, and we say to people in that region, you know, you're welcome to go to one of those groups. Some are advertised, some are not, for various reasons. But occasionally some of those groups might say, why don't we all get together and do something even more significant? Three house churches together, a group of 50, let's go. And, and whatever it looks like, go to the shopping centre and pray, go witnessing, or we have a prayer meeting for the local school and hospital. Whatever a regional anointing will, will uh, be able to, to accomplish. So remember we've got individual anointings, we've got corporate anointings. Um, you can see the little circles of the house churches, for example, and the little crosses are what we call... Um, Min, uh, marketplace ministry. We love marketplace ministry. It's something that God is going to emphasise more and more and more. Great commission Christians go into all the world and preach the gospel. They don't say to the unbelievers, come to church and we'll preach to you. We will come to you. We will preach and love you where you are, give you the good news. So there's many, many, many valid marketplace expressions. And how about second and fourth? Maybe that you could do that on a second or a fourth I'm only giving this as an option and God confirms. I, I can't make anything happen. I've worked that out years ago. Especially with free people. You can't lead free people. You've just got to keep pointing them to Jesus and he leads us all. You can, you can lead people who are afraid of you. Uh, if you've got a religious controlling spirit, you can make people do almost anything. But when you're set free, you and I are more interested in having self-government from the spirit than they are with someone telling you how to do it. And that's the right way. It's I'm self-regulated, I'm self-governed, I'm self-motivated, I get it from God, it fits in with what we're doing, count on me. But if it's imposed upon you, you know vision should never be imposed from the head down, vision should rise from the people up. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? What's in your heart? What's in your heart? And, and you, can, you can have options and opportunities to do it. So we have here a congregation, we say community building on the third Sunday, fantastic. First Sunday is more of an apostolic hub. Sometimes you'll attract people from other groups who'll come in on that first Sunday to get what they feel is apostolic direction. Apostolic just means that you're building the kingdom. You're not trying to build your local church. You and I are not anointed to build the church. We're anointed to preach the gospel of the kingdom and Jesus said, no, I'll build the church. If you'll preach the gospel of the kingdom, I'll sort out your church. If you try and sort out your church, you'll be manipulating, you'll be controlling, you'll be making people feel bad, you'll be shouting out about more money, more money, more money. And that's what people do. Why? They're trying to make a name for themselves, a name for their denomination or their congregation or their abomination. And they're trying to make people say, you leave and you will get the left foot of fellowship before you reach the door. Well, that's not God. That is not God. It doesn't represent the heart of God. God says, just keep preaching the gospel, let her, let her rip and I'll, I'll sort out the rest. First Sunday, Apostolic Hub, we come with that. Now some of those who used to meet with us, let me just quickly say this to fill in for, for perhaps newer people. Uh, the group from Mandurah, Darren and Rada and group used to meet every Sunday, first Sunday of the month with us. There came a time and it was pretty clear they needed to birth something. Number one, they live in Mandurah. Number two, there were people driving up and down all the time and we thought, well you've got an anointing and a gifting, do it there. They do it, they do it well. And that's happened with Dave and Kate. Dave and Kate uh, Williams used to come every Sunday and their little group used to come, which now become a bigger group, 50, 60, 70, 80 people. Esther House used to come, 30, 40 girls would fill the place. Now every Sunday night they have their own church, 80, 90 young people turn up. Uh, Raw Church, the church for under 40s, 
under 40s, uh, I wish, I wish, that's growing, 30, 40 young people starting to gather together. Now they've all been given permission to fulfil that commission. Hallelujah. And they should be thriving. And then there's the hip-hop church. Oh my God, the hip-hop church. How can that be church? It can be church. Why? Two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus and they're preaching through a language that I don't understand. <laughs> and you go into that cafe and that place can have 30, 40, 50 young people. They came here, they'd be yawning, they'd be, I don't know what they'd be doing. And it's just not right or wrong, it's just what God is saying is relevant to where they're at at this point with their cultural understanding. Why make it difficult for Australia to connect with God by having church services that we've done for 400 years in the same way? I mean, ever since Constantine sort of put his brand on Christianity, you've always had the thing at the front, the main aisle here, and you had, I mean, hardly anything's changed. At least every now and again we put our chairs in a circle. That causes a revolution. <laughs> Even some people can't pray. Oh my God, we're in a circle, I can't pray. <laughs> so. Ridiculous. How about in some of the places where there's revival, there's no room for any chairs? They're just totally packed, packed filled with people. No one gets slain in the spirit because there's nowhere to fall. You sort of just go... So, so you can see from that map that there, there, there is a structure, a framework. People, there is a lot of people around who say we don't want church structure. Let me tell you this, you have to have structure. But structure has to be a framework that enhances the move of the Holy Spirit. It's not rules and regulations because you want it that way. It's because this facilitates God's flow. So therefore we come in with thanksgiving and praise and worship because we know that God inhabits the high praises. We know that this is a worship service so it's appropriate to spend time simply worshipping God. No other agenda. Worshipping God. And then when God starts to move, you go with him somewhere. Today was intercession. Uh, and warfare today. And we could say, right, next week we come, we're going to go into war and find there's no anointing for it then you've got bashing cymbals around, you know, making a noise and nothing's happening in the spirit. I know one guy had a revival meeting in Indonesia and it was so awesome. God, God came in the dance and the whole place erupted, 10,000 people dancing, 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 dancing. Apparently it went on for about three quarters of an hour. All in the spirit. Nehemiah 8.10, the Lord, he rejoices over us with singing, but the word there is he twirls for joy. You want a conservative Jesus? You got the wrong one. He twirls for joy, dancing in the midst of the congregation, singing and dancing and twirling, the things that offend our flesh sometimes. He's doing it. He's the culprit. <laughs> Rejoicing over us. The next night, revival meeting, more than 10,000 people because God moved last night in such a fantastic way. Preacher gets up, come on, we're all going to dance. He said it was like lifting up dead weight. Imagine 10,000 people all trying to... He said, no anointing. No anointing whatsoever. No anointing whatsoever. What does that say to you? Follow the Lord. Follow the prompting. Obey what he's up to now. As it is in heaven, so it should be on earth. What happens if heaven's in deep repentance? No you screaming for joy. I mean, this joy is going to scream regardless of what happens, but... There's no, no point in all of us saying, come on, we've got, to have, we've got to have joy if in fact the mood of heaven is repent. We have to be open to that kind of lead us, Lord. <laughs> lead us, Lord. Lead us, Lord. Okay, church structure is a framework, flexible, adaptable to grow and change. Say the word change. Change. It's organic, held together by love, trust, principles and values. Hallelujah. It's God-centric, spirit-empowered, word-based. Everybody dreams and fulfil their God-given purpose. Hallelujah. We had a young lady who was saved, a <laughs> saved about three weeks ago and she, she said, I haven't been to church, I think she said it for about eight years. And, she, and I said, well, you know, is there a... I'm almost scared to ask, what's the reason? Because she's going to give me a reason. And she said, because I, I find that I am filled with creative ideas but I've got no one to share them with at church. And I thought, that's very sad. Now that may or may not be true. She might have only tried it with one person and was shut down. 
she said, would there ever be a possibility of a creative arts church? I didn't pray about it. I said, yes. Then I'm thinking of all the implications of helping it start. Yes. She said, well, I've got friends who'd come. Boom, just like that. And they'd come with their paint to do their artwork. They'd come with their, I don't know what else, what else do you do? Do their pottery? Uh, they <laughs> Bring your own potty. And you'd have the creative... <laughs> this service is getting crazy. Start, start and... You know what it is? It's that drunken glory starting to come. Oh, my Lord. Emphasis in body life. Highly relational. No one stands alone. Wider participation. It's missional. It's intentional. Great commission Christians. It's central. Now, some people say, but I, you know, I live in two rocks. I don't want to go to North Perth and I totally agree. However... Maybe it could make sense you come down for an apostolic hub gathering but then you have local church expression the other weeks or at least two of the other weeks. So there you've got your local church plus you've got access to anointings that could empower you to go and do it. See, the only problem with doing a little thing on its own is you haven't got access to some of the resources you may need. Now, you have got Jesus. I'm not speaking against it. I know, I know successful small groups that just seem to bear a lot of fruit. I know a lot of others who, who end up dying because they didn't have enough perhaps import or didn't find a wider expression or something. I'm not speaking against anything. I'm speaking for something today. So it can be local church expressions, different. Different groups and ministries have different dynamics. If you've got different dynamics, you've got a different atmosphere that's created. See, a group where all ten are talking and sharing and, and sharing their hurt and their pain and the healing gifts are moving, that atmosphere is different than a a t- more of a teaching input type atmosphere which is what we're doing today but if this is only what church looked like we're not scriptural we're only very partially scriptural but we're scriptural because there is a need for church to come together celebrate, particularly celebrate and finally at the bottom there we impact the community we, we transform not just inform so the little circle in the middle is the apostolic hub the without walls community uh, house churches throughout the suburbs uh, call them grace gatherings and then marketplace ministries so this may just cause you to pray and to think and to come and talk to some of the leaders and, um, and just say well I'd like to do church differently I've got a heart, I've got a vision, I've got a dream uh, certainly connect with this wider expression because there's important uh, reasons why we should do it think of us as a body rather than a machine with parts that don't matter Oh, well, that, they're not there, so we'll just get more in to replace them. No, no, it's not like that. We, the body needs each other. The body or love each other to that degree. We really do care. Okay, we're open to let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. The, the final thing I felt to say was from, and people ask this a lot, particularly in our kind of meetings. Sometimes the meetings can be extremely free and fantastic. As long as it's in the Spirit, I don't care. Uh, you know me by now. But in verse 40 of that 1 Corinthians 14, it says this thing that I get quoted every now and again. It says this, Let all things be done decently and in order. Pastor Phil. Yeah, okay. I have read it. I have had it quoted before. And I actually know what it means. Because if you go through 1 Corinthians and you go through that whole chapter and you begin to read what's said in that chapter and what's emphasised, you come with two words that are continually used throughout the chapter that concludes with, let everything be decent and in order. Now I've said this before, but if you like absolute maximum order, you go and have church at Karakata. (laughs) Because in Karakata, in the cemetery, You will not find a more ordered place. The only problem is this, there's no life. So if you like that kind of order, you can have it, but don't expect spirit life. Because spirit life comes as he wills. And he blows as he wills. And he messes up if he needs to. And he turns it upside down if he has to. And true restoration, at the heart of restoration is restoration of the heart. And he comes and he doesn't mind all the stuff as long as there's two things happening that I'll tell you about. But what he really minds is this. 
the condition of the heart. And he's looking at the heart. He's not overly offended if one foot's kicking up to the left and the other foot's kicking up to the right and the hands are going up and down. That's not, that's not a problem. He's actually looking motivation, intent. What are they doing? Is this for me? Is this because they love one another? Is this how a body functions? Are they trying actually to work together as one? Is anyone being drawing attention to themselves? Well, that's not right. We'll, we'll correct it. At the heart of restoration is restoration of the heart, the motive, the intent. It's not what it looks like. It's what did you intend by that. Hallelujah. So what we think is so acceptable to God, this wonderful reverence, God could be outside trying to not to get in. So I actually want to come stir up the place by the anointing. Oh no, we don't do that here, Lord. We just have these nice, quiet little meetings. Well, God is not always quiet. There is silence in heaven, but there's also shouting and there's also noise in heaven and the throne room is like a, a disco centre where thunder and lightning proceed out of the throne. And so some people have to get their heart and mind to adjust to what the Spirit is saying and doing. And uh, the two words used throughout that entire chapter of everything being done decently is this. One word, edification. It's about ten times in that chapter. Let all things be done that will build others up and edify and encourage. If it's not encouraging building up, don't do it. Or secondly, (laughs) I like to think it's revival, but I think it's teenagers. Um, (laughs) Secondly, not only uh, edification, but exor... No, no, it's not. Sounds good, but it's not. It's in intelligibility. In other words, does this actually mean something? So, for God to have things decent, he says, is this meaningful? Is it, you know, like, does it mean something? And is it building you up? If it is, go for it. How's that? That's what it means. That's what the chapter means. Let everything be edifying, building up, everyone getting encouraged and blessed. Secondly, it's got to have meaning. If you decide, well, I'm going to run around the church for the sake of it, there's no meaning in it. Don't to be tested and we, we grow into maturity. And I think church can become a very desirous, wonderful experience so that 93% will be in church because it's such a joy to be in freedom and grace. And So, Father... I don't know whether we did a good job but we tried Lord because we want church to really glorify your name and we want it to connect with this city Lord God. And Lord you said without walls and here we are sometimes in the walls but Lord tomorrow we're out there and the rest of this day we're out there. Help us to connect homes, hearts, businesses, coffee shops, wherever, however. We ask for the grace. Just reach out to the one next to you and say... uh, just ask for the grace, the grace, the grace, the grace. 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 Kura Brandana Namande.